Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Peters at the Poison Pen, or actually I'm Barbara Peters at home in my office, not at the Poison Pen. And I'm really pleased to be with three of my favorite guys today. So over there, H. Ripley, I can't say it, H. Ripley Rawlings IV, who is the author with a new book. Rip. Hey, good, good to see you. you. Thanks for having us on and happy birthday. Well, thank you very much. Below him, Mark Greeny, um, author, friend forever, um, and all kinds of interesting things happening in his life. So we are going to at least have to talk a little bit about the movie, not to mention dogs, because uh, <laughs> Mark has inspired me to get into the puppy world. And <laughs> so envious, Mark Cameron. Why, why do I feel like that's not that's going to come back and bite me at some point? <laughs> it's not going to bite you. No, no, no. no. I absolutely love it. I mean, serious. And you know what? They have taken over Instagram. I mean, if I don't post yeah. a picture, then people complain. Yeah. So yeah. Um, who knew that they were going to be so much fun? Anyway, um, and I am entirely envious of his fire because it's 90 here, but it's like 29 <laughs> in Alaska. Mark Cameron. So is this the last fire of summer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Summer, <laughs> was, summer was over a couple of days ago, and we had our last snow of summer, and now we're having our first snows of fall. So. <laughs> wow, you get to have a fire for months as compared yeah. to here. Mark, Rocky many... is telling me that I could actually turn on the fire, but with the air conditioning <laughs> blasting, I just don't feel it's so on green energy, right? I just don't That's feel right. like I could do that. So we're here to talk about um, Rip's uh, second book for Tice Asher, although it's actually his third book. So why don't I ask Mark to tell us first a little bit about Red Metal and how the two of them um wrote together it, it just occurred to me there's two marks here i don't know that <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, sorry. but since i I'll did fight. write red metal i know that um, <laughs> yeah so yeah so red metal is is a book that rip and i wrote that came out in 2019 i met rip at the pentagon i think in 2014 i'm not 100 percent sure and uh, when i was working on a tom clancy novel and we became good buddies and we talked about uh, book ideas for a long time and he was a writer hadn't been published yet but he's a good writer so we uh it it just grew and grew and grew and then sooner or later i, I was like hey i think i can go out and get us a book deal for this idea that we have <laughs> and then we went around right rip and we went to yeah. germany and i went to poland and you went to france and yeah. we went out to nellis air force base and we did a, a ton of research on it and um it came out in 19 and it did really well and we are in the process of writing the sequel to that right now. COVID, I think, has really slowed us down because it's. We did so much location research for the first one; it just wouldn't be part of the series if you just, you know, did the did the next one without some of that research. So hopefully, that'll be out in 2023. Um, I, I think that's what we're shooting for, and uh, yeah. can't wait to, to be done again. We had a Very blast. Exciting. I mean, we, the Nellis Air Force Base thing was fantastic. Mark, yeah. Mark, and I are fond of telling the story about how. They kind of adopted us and we got to go into one of their little famous watering holes and you know drink scotch out of a giant 30 caliber gun barrel <laughs> it was a blast so i don't i think if we don't do at least a few trips we're going to be remiss i was telling mark actually for red metal part two there's a uh part of it takes place in asia and there's a spot in japan that where i was stationed for a while right below mount fuji and they have a german uh brewery and it's like a brewery village and it's all you can drink beer. So I said, if there's no other reason, we need to stop in there and take yeah. a look at it. There will be a battle scene in that in that town. I can just yeah. feel it already. Yeah. So beer and <laughs> sake, the two Japanese beverages. Yeah. I love it. Right. right. Yeah. I've been to a sake thing, but I didn't. Um, I'm not a beer drinker, so I didn't think when we've been in Japan a few times that I've ever been to see this particular location. But I guess you guys would sort it out. We were lucky enough to have Mark Greeny and uh, rip at the poison pen for red metal that was that was great so was mr brainy i think i'll call you both by your last name so we don't have <laughs> okay. confusion here um <laughs> you know you've written the gray man series and we'll talk about the movie as part of all this but you know was it how was it writing with somebody who's actually served in the military um you know did it was it educational was it unnerving how did it work uh, i guess it was both of those things i had been a ghost writer um, for a couple of books with someone who had served in the military. So I'd already gone through that whole imposter syndrome thing of like, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll send rip pages and it's totally Flash Gordon stuff, you know, it's like, and then the, you know, the tank drove upside down for three miles, and you know, whatever, I get whatever wrong. And uh, you just have to sort of like 
totally let go of your ego and say, all right, there's 75 things wrong right here. And I'm sure uh, Mark, uh, the other Mark, um, has the same thing when working on the Tom Clancy books. Is like, you have to go out and get all that information and there's no way you can do it, do it without, you know, showing huge gaps in your own knowledge. But with Rip, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it, it, it served us both that we were already friends and we literally talked about this stuff for three years at that point. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that helped and made it, uh, you know, a, an easy transition. Well, it, it was fun. Yeah, you, you introduced me to Rip. I can't remember where it was in New Orleans or maybe I can't remember. Um, you said, I want, I want to introduce this guy. You're going to like him. And absolutely. We, we've become yeah. good friends since you introduced us. And I remember sitting at Rip's kitchen table <laughs> doing exactly what you talked about with the Clancy's where I, I was like, okay, here's my idea, but what would really happen now? So, and, and then he was, the good thing about working with Rip is that he's so energetic when he comes to his ideas and then they can do this and they can do this. And I was like, yeah, why don't you just take this notepad and write all that down? <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, awesome if you would do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Mark Cameron, actually, his background is not, well, maybe you could call it sort of quasi-military. You're a U.S. Marshal or have been a U.S. Marshal, right? Right, right. No, not military, law enforcement. We do work quite a bit with the military, um, but strictly federal civilian law enforcement. But it was, uh, you know, a lot of guns and, you know, tactics and things like that. But definitely a different, uh, uh, you know, different uh, orders of, of rules of engagement <laughs> kind of a thing. still dangerous still deadly <laughs> lot well, your lot arsenal of, would be different right so rip tell us a little bit about your new book oh thanks well I, one thing i ought to mention is i mean obviously it's flattering to be on online with with all three of you all it's, it's good to see everybody kind of even during covid because we've missed all our conferences this year and i've yeah for me, those energize the hell out of me because you're around writers, oh, yeah. especially, you know, being around writers like Mark uh, of the caliber, Mark uh, Graney and Mark Cameron, where you can kind of chat and, and hear what they're doing in the business. But I don't know. I would say it's fun talking and writing with with these two gentlemen. Also, they, uh, they flatter me by saying it was fun to write with me uh, or just to hang out with me. But it was it's, it's cool. Mark had some Mark uh, Graney talked to me once and said, Rip. I read a techno novel once where it was written by a military guy. He had all the bona fides in the world. And it was the most boring thing I've ever read because the guy was so into techni the, the technical details. He said, so Rip, what you need to do is you have to learn to balance. I mean, throw in the tech, make sure it's accurate 100%. But at the same token, if it doesn't flow and it's not fun, it, it doesn't matter if the details are accurate. It's boring. So I don't know. I, I appreciate what everybody said, but it's threefold back, back right back at him. <laughs> Well, okay, so the so yeah, here's here's Killbox right here. You see it strategically placed next to a couple other good books over there, and then some others on the other side. They didn't write, but make me look smart. But um, yeah, Killbox is the continuation of the Tice Asher series. Uh, in in this series, so the Russians invade America to kind of shorten the 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 uh, intro on book one, and they do it through some clever means. They have three. They have a computer that gives them some ideas, and the computers crafted kind of pieced together but it's very well maintained and well run and well established uh, and it says look if three things happen in the united states you could probably launch an invasion and one is if the u.s decides to disarm its nuclear weapons down to a certain stage and that's uh, strategic we really only have a strategic stockpile the, the russians have uh, tactical nuclear weapons and we really don't uh, the second is if they curtail the Second Amendment in some regards, it is a consideration. I know it's it's interesting for people to talk about, but the Russians do consider the fact that we have in private ownership about 400,000 <laughs> privately owned firearms. So we're a, 400 million, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry, 400, 400 million. Yeah. Yeah. I was off by an order magnitude. I was yeah, going to say that's just in Alaska. 400, 000, <laughs> I was going to say just in my that's, house. <laughs> that's just Northern Virginia. <laughs> well, no, yeah, 400 million is, is, is correct. And I think that doesn't even include pistols. That's just like long guns. But so we're an exceedingly well armed society. And, you know, we're better armed than a lot of smaller countries are. So it, it's a factor for people when they're considering what could we do to the United States. So if we curtail the Second Amendment in the book, uh, then they say there's a, an impetus potentially to attack. And the third uh, precept is if the United States launches into kind of another protracted engagement overseas. And We've been doing this for years. And of course, 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, 
we did it for a long enough time that it did take notice. Russians, we know, and uh, China and others, North Korea, for instance, and of course, Iran, were studying our tactics downrange and watching for vulnerabilities back at home. So the book is, you know, it is a red dawn meets uh, kind of the dirty dozen. Uh, you get these hillbillies and stuff up in the mountains. And hopefully that's the rich part of the characters that makes it exciting. So in book two, it's a continuation from there. Uh, you know, you can certainly read it as a standalone, but with the book um, in the kill box, the Russians have gotten a hold of some chemical material and they realize they're suffering some great setbacks against uh, a couple army divisions that are still in the United States and they decide to use it. And so it's up to our hero and his kind of cadre of, of, of dudes and dudettes to figure this all out and try to stop it. And I mean, I, I think besides the larger Russian plan, there's a female antagonist who is very bad. I mean, it's as Mark Graney and Mark Cameron have told me over and over again at the conferences, it's, it's a lot of fun to write bad guys. I mean, the, the good guys are exciting to write too. And, you know, you have to get in their head and figure out what their motivations are and make sure that they're lovable. And, and uh, but at the same time, you know, their trials and tribulations are worthy of anybody who's a, a good reader reading them, but making a, an excellent antagon, uh, antagonist is, is really what makes the protagonist glow is that they're not half the people that you want them to be unless their opponent is, is really tough. So in this case, we've got a female um, antagonist and she, I don't want to spoil it, but she's pretty darn tough and she's not, she doesn't really have a lot of remorse. So she ends up kind of sticking it to the good guys quite a bit. In fact, in the very opening scenes, uh, she hurts one of the main characters pretty badly. So um, I don't know, it's, it's worth, you know, kind of hitting from, from there, but it's a lot of fun writing kind of the bad guy, you know. Oh, who would like to comment, Mr. Greeny? Uh, or Mr. Cameron? Yeah, I was just gonna say, she's got, she's got different colored eyes, right? Yeah. You're talking about yep. Stacy. Yeah, yeah Stacy so is her American name, yeah. It, it's funny how everybody, and, and Mark's going to probably discover this if he hasn't already from from uh, people sending him emails. But when people when I, when you watch a movie, part of the reason that makes it so disappointing sometimes is we have something already in our head as far as what Jack Reacher looks like. Let's just say that, or you know what so what Stacy looks like. And it's funny when I I used to be a horseshoer to make ends meet when I was a police officer and my my daughter and her husband have a, a beautiful Aussie but I remember this one particular place I used to go and shoe horses that had this evil Australian shepherd that would come out and try to bite me every time I went to that <laughs> ranch and she had two different colored eyes so yeah. when I read about Stacy that's who I, I picture yeah. this that's a good Australian yeah, like... shepherd that's trying to bite me that they yeah. would hide under the truck and wait until I was passed so she'd come out and just work me over. Yeah, she's got heterochromia. They're all female. I love that. You know, it's a two, it's a two color yeah. eye. This one, this one happened to be a female dog, but. Right. Yeah, um, heterochromia is interesting. I mean, I had to do a fair amount of research on heterochromia. And it's handy having some medicine in the family. My wife's a, yeah. a doctor, but yeah. I could ask her a lot of medical questions. She helped me find, there's a scene in the book where they have to go steal some drugs from the local hospital, the good kind, the, the hospital kind of drugs and uh, medicine, basically. And um, so I don't know, it's, it's good to have somebody in the family that I can bounce this off of. But I I did research heterochromia quite a bit. And it's interesting. It's it's amazing how many actors and actresses have it. And you don't really even notice in their movies. But having two different colored eyes is a uh, it's a it's a it's an oddity. I mean, the percentage of, a, of heterochromia is very small, but it also can come with some bad side effects. So I wrote that into the story as well. There's another disease called polychoria. And if you have heterochromia, you're more predisposed to have polychoria, which means you have two pupillary openings, uh, or you may, you can have two pupillary openings in, your, in one of your eyes. And that's very damaging. And especially in its, its kind of early stages, if it's not corrected. So I don't know, it's fun to write the bad characters. It's also fun to write flaws. Those are, you know, Mark, Mark uh, Cameron taught me quite a bit about flaws and was talking about that with some Kind of how he writes his character so i learned a lot from from both gentlemen about stuff like that and it's a fun so story mark right? Reedy and mark cameron you've both um written in the tom clancy universe where you didn't get to you know rip got to make everything up from the beginning right but when you <laughs> took on clancy um there were already parameters and characterizations and stuff that you had to do so mark Rainey, when you start you know the gray man was your 
own creation that Clancy clearly was not. Um, how did that feel going back and forth? You know, it, it's all a whirlwind looking back on it. Someday Mark Cameron will, uh, will pass the torch to somebody else. And then if he's like me, he's going to be like, wait, did that really happen? Yeah. Um, I did seven books in six years. And these are obviously long, big books. And um, but I do remember that it wasn't that hard because they are very distinct worlds with almost different uh, realities and, and whatnot in them. I like the fact that the Clancy world was well established because I was a, a massive fan of those books. So to get to play in that sandbox was such an amazing thing to, to be able to do. I, I never ran around going like, well, if, I, if I'd written Jack Ryan, he would be more like this or less like this. I don't remember ever thinking that once about any character in the series. It, it's just, you know, those are the rules you're, pl you're playing, you know, chess with a chess board where you know the, the, all the, you know, all the pieces and, and what they can do. So it, it never really, you know, I wrote two books a year for several, several years, and it would be a Clancy book and a gray man and a Clancy and a gray man. And they were very distinct between the two of them. Of course, you're editing one while you're writing another. So there's that back and forth where, I mean, maybe Mark, you've done this too. You, you write the wrong name down, you know, and oh, yeah. um, you, you know, your protagonist from your other series is suddenly a, a character in your book. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, on the day, little things like that can happen, but it, it was surprisingly not that tough. Ditto when I wrote Red Metal with Rip, it was, it was such a different world than the, than the gray man world that it was just, great and as much as i enjoy writing gray man books it's great to go do something different i'm writing something different now and then i'm uh, rip and i are going to write another book and it's it's going to be great to get away from that and i feel like you know long term that makes the quality of the gray man books better when you get a little break in between to, to work on something else so mark yeah, cameron you've written about uh jericho quinn and you're writing arlo's cut you know cutter Better. Mm -hmm. Cutter, sorry. Um, how how has that worked for you? Because you're how many Clancy's have you done? We're doing something fifth. with you. On number December five 16th comes out. Yep. Number five so comes out. Is that going to be the fifth one? Yep. That will, and then we're doing it, one more after that. So we'll see. I'd like to kind of like to leave Mark as the king of the Clancy's, but we'll see. Never say never. But I, <laughs> it is a lot of a. Uh, a lot of back and forth, but but I'm the same with Mark, and I had the double uh, pleasure of writing Tom Clancy's characters and then writing Mark's characters. Um, I think, or, or maybe there were Grants. Did you come up with Adara or and Midas? Uh, yeah, I came up with both of them. It, it, this yeah. sounds very cruel. I love I love Grant Blackwood and what he did, but um, to have some skin in the game, I had to kill some characters off. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. going to kill Clancy's people off. So <laughs> I was just slaughtering everybody. That, that, um, and so you, you're welcome to do that. To me, Mark. No, no, I love them. I, Actually, yeah, I think I, I, I love your to hear about that in advance. <laughs> no, I love your characters. And I, I actually give Adara quite a bit of page time in the last book, Shadow, or right. no, maybe Code of Honor. I can't remember. I give her quite a bit of page time with Ding. What I try to do is put one of your characters with the legacy one. But, you know, let's face it, you wrote seven. So many, many people that read these books, they view Midas and Adara as legacy characters yeah. and, and with good reason. And so yeah. I have to say, not to be a, a fanboy, but you, you really helped me um, understand the characters. I remember early on asking you simple questions like what, what kind of what's what's Jack Jr.'s favorite soccer team or, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, because I think even with the military stuff with these books, you just can't get it wrong. You can you can leave stuff out. I don't have to talk about what happens when you load a howitzer or whatever, but I can't load it wrong. And the same <laughs> yeah. thing with the yeah. Clancy stuff, as long as you as long as I don't have them drinking the wrong kind of whiskey or you know, or whatever, or put them in the wrong kind of plane. Um, then I, I still think we have a lot of, a lot of freedom with the Clancy's. Um, yeah, sure. Like Clancy didn't write a great deal about Kathy Ryan. Um, she was in some yeah. of all fears quite a bit because, you know, people even, and, and Tom Colgan is a great editor and he's, you know, he's holding fast to the, you got to keep Clancy Clancy. And sometimes I'll remind him, oh no, Jack had a drinking problem in some of our fears. He had all kinds of problems. He's a human. We can allow him to be a little bit human. 
Um, and as long as I prove my case, he lets me lets me yeah. do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we still we have a lot of a lot of leeway, and it makes it great fun. Great fun. Well, I'm really glad know. that we'll get to talk to you in December. As I said, I think it's the 16th. Um, or is it November? Yeah. No, it's November. Uh, no, November. Oh. November. All right. And we'll, we'll be talking to Mark about Mark Cameron yeah. about the new Clancy. So, Rip, what is it? Um, how come some of you military guys develop an urge, or maybe you always had an urge to be a novelist? I'm still, you know, I've talked to Jack Carr about that endlessly. And yeah. of course, he points out that his mother was a librarian and force fed books to him for years. But <laughs> um, what is it that inspired you to want to write? I, you know, I think it's probably similar in, in that when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a classicist and my mom was a radio personality and she's also a novelist and a writer. So she wrote a magazine. She was the editor of uh, Country Living, Mountain Home, Log Cabin, and a couple others. I can't remember. And then she had a radio show. And so uh, there's also a fairly big oral tradition in my family. My family is predominantly from the South. And the, the kind of legacy all my aunts gave me was I was one of the cousins or, you know, nephews who would listen and sit on their knee and kind of while well, they would hold their knitting while they would tell me <laughs> stories about the family because we had all these kind of rich stories about great uncle so-and-so and great aunt so-and-so. And so I think it started there. I, I know that when I was a kid, you know, everyone else was reading Winnie the Pooh and my dad would read us like the seven against Thebes and he would read us the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so, you know, I don't, I think we came up with a, you know, not so square back, or I guess it's very square uh, background <laughs> is that we ended up reading, you know, a lot of these kind of classics. I, I was, I was turned on to reading also when I was really young. I think I was about seven years old when I started reading the Captain Horatio Hornblower series. I got big into Sherlock Holmes. Um, so I started reading mysteries at a very young age, obviously all the Hardy Boys uh, series. Uh, so kind of all that stuff was ingrained in my mind as a young man. And I got into Agatha Christie and, and I think those are those types of novels are really the development of, of real thrillers is that they have suspense and there's someone who usually gets hurt in them, but you care about the characters and you really want them to come to a good conclusion. You know, you don't need everything tied up with a, a bow, but you do wanna know who killed so-and-so in the library with poison. So I, I don't think that thrillers are that far away from it. And so for me, it was uh, quickly on to the Tom Clancy's that these two gentlemen wrote, uh, you know, first, you know, Tom Clancy himself and then their books. And so I, I was weaned very early on with a lot of reading and a lot of writing. But in, in college, I got um, a dual degree in both English literature and German literature. So I think it was it was an anomaly that I went into the military. <laughs> I think it's I would put it on its head and say it was not uh, it's not an anomaly that I was interested in writing. It just was kind of unusual. I know I remember coming home and telling my my mom and my sister and their jaws dropped and said, what are you what are you thinking? And I said, well, I don't know, I want to go serve. So 23 years later, I'm probably going back to what I should have done when I when I got out of college. Yeah, but there's a real practical value in having been in the military, which is sure. that when you exit after however many years it is, I thought it was sort of a basic 20, but I might be wrong on that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, they, there's an income um, because, there you is. know, and that means that you're not facing a problem that many writers face, which is, you know, how are you going to support yourself while you're trying to figure out the whole writing game? Mark Rainey, how did you get into writing? Well, um, I'm just a huge fan of reading as, as a kid and growing up. I never, I didn't read any novels like past once I was like 10 years old or, or whatever until I was a, almost 20. I was probably about 19. And I read it, but I read a ton of nonfiction, a lot of his, history. Um, I read a lot of World War II stuff, Civil War stuff, a lot of espionage stuff. And I just picked up a Tom Clancy book um, in the grocery store, which is still the closest grocery store to where I live and, um, <clears throat> and bought it. And it was Patriot Games. And I just became obsessed with the genre. So between the ages of like 19 and 25, I probably read, well, hun hundreds of books. And pretty narrow in that genre. People ask me all the time, they're like, you know, do you read stuff in other genres? I'm like, you probably should, um, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I, some, I mean, I like Dean Koontz. There's, there's a lot of authors I like, but I mean, I, I stuck pretty much within that genre. And I had an idea for a story and I started working on it and I worked on it for 15 years before I finished it. And then I shelved it and wrote something else and then something else and then something else and I got published. So it was my fourth uh, completed novel. But I, I started writing my first book when I was 22 and I got published when I was 42. So don't do what I did and do it differently. 
What did you do? What did you do for income while you were spending 20 years waiting to be published? Well, uh, uh, Mark Cameron said that he was uh, in law enforcement and so he worked closely with the military. I was thinking, well, I was a bartender and I worked really closely with the military in that field as well. Um, That's accurate. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was a bartender through college and then even after college, I tried to get into Air Force uh, OCS officer candidate school and uh, didn't get in. This was kind of during the Clinton drawdown years. So that's my excuse, um, probably just whatever. And then I went into international sales. I'd always like enjoyed travel the little bit that I had done and I enjoyed foreign languages. So um, I worked in Miami, I sold uh, kind of like import export business. And uh, I did it for Memphis and from Miami. And I did that for in one capacity or another for you know, the next 20 years, I was working at Medtronic, which is a big medical device company in their international department when I when I finally got published. I know you love to travel. Every time I look at your Instagram pictures, you're somewhere. Um, well, I'm in I'm in New York right now. And I'm, so, so Mark, you, Mark and, and Rip have these great backdrops. And I just I just popped into this hotel like 30 minutes ago, changed my <laughs> shirt and turned on my computer. So. Well, it looks great. I knew you weren't in your gorgeous home office because we've yeah. done several events where, you know, you've been at home and it's really magnificent. Beautiful. Kudos yeah. to your wife, Allison, for making yeah. such a gorgeous background for you. Mm -hmm. So, Mark Cameron, you were in law enforcement. You know, you were a cop. You were a horseshoer, which I'd forgotten. But now you remind me. And, you know, you've been a U.S. Marshal. What what prompted you to take up writing? You know, I think the same as these guys. I wanted to write first. And um, I also wanted to be in law enforcement. So, it was a way to make a living while I was getting, these were the days probably like Mark went through where you, you got written rejection letters. And uh, usually it was like a piece of confetti, <laughs> you know, not for <laughs> us that sort of fluttered out of your, your self-addressed stamped envelope and got a lot of rejection for about 20 years. That seems to be a common thread. Um, I just always, I love to read. My mother's a teacher, my grandmother's a teacher, my aunt was a librarian. Bought, brought me a book, um, a signed copy of Where the Red Fern Grows when I was in the third grade. And I remember reading that and thinking, yeah, I want to, actually, I took it to my third grade class and my, I read it, took it and my third grade teacher read it and she cried her eyes out. And I thought, yeah, I want to make people do this. I want to make those changes. But one of the things I really respect about these particular two authors, and there are others, but I know Mark does a lot of a lot of tactical training and goes out and shoots and learns about weapon systems and talks to the military and special forces and law enforcement and travel. But he's a writer first. And Rip is a writer first. When we talk about, when Rip and I chat <coughs> about stuff, he's got this military experience, but he wants to talk about the mechanics of writing <coughs> and the craft of writing. And that's, that's really kind of a, I, I'm, like I say, there are others there's not as many as there should be, I, I think. I think a lot of people, we lean on our own experience and maybe not, you know, just tell a war story, but not worry about the craft as much. And these two gentlemen worry about the craft, which makes it really pleasant to chat with them about writing. It does. You know, you point out, I think all three of you point out that perseverance is a key factor to, to writing and becoming published. It also sort of helps to who you know. Sometimes it's a really oh, lucky true. break, you know, if you meet somebody who will take up um, your writing, that can yeah, be a, yeah. a wonderful help. So I did want to ask you, I don't want to go into the politics of Afghanistan and so forth. I will say as an historian that as an historian would know, Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. Um, and so I won't debate whether we should have gone there or why we should have left. But I do want to ask, um, because it's sort of a parallel question, has Russia really come back as the major antagonist for political thrillers? Rip, would your book really have worked if you decided to make it the Chinese instead of the Russians? I, it would absolutely work for both, yeah. I, it's interesting to watch Russia, China, North Korea, Iran on the world stage because they are very greed-centric entities. Um, Mark and I send emails back and forth on little articles and tidbits that we read. And China has been doing a lot of very dirty deeds behind people's backs. And I, I think one of the greatest aspects of a democracy, you know, all of us democracies, because we're, you know, certainly a, a good one, but there's quite a few others, is that we do most of our stuff in the light of day, not everything. Some bad politics happens, you know, behind closed doors, but usually is revealed. 
Whereas, you know, China and Russia do the majority of their dirty deeds behind closed doors. We don't see it. And when it does come to light, we're astonished at just how kind of greedy they are. I mean, you know, we've, you could go back to Thucydides and say that's kind of what nations do is that they look out for their people by trying to beg, borrow and steal uh, things that they need. But I don't know. I, I tend to think that, um, you know, th that's it, well, it makes for great writing. It makes for fantastic books because they uh, they don't have any compunction doing bad things to others, um, especially smaller nations that can't defend themselves. So I, I don't know. I, I think that you asked, should we be in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq? Or I guess your question more was, you know, no, I didn't. I, I just said no. I think Afghanistan has historically been the graveyard of empires. It yeah. hasn't worked. It didn't work for the British. It didn't work for the Russians. There yeah. wasn't any real reason to assume it was going to work for us. But, you know, there we I, are. you know, I, I tend to I, obviously as a guy who served there, I have a vested interest in saying some good stuff about it. And I, the one thing I would say is that we did have 20 years of relative peace from a country that um, otherwise was producing some people that wanted to hurt us. So I, I don't know if it's worth the price. I'll leave that to historians like yourself to decide. But I will say that 20 years of, of relative peace is, you know, if you look throughout all of history, uh, you know, Pax Romana, there's a lot of a lot of pieces that are broken by very violent wars. And uh, in a lot of regards, we've been able to hold off what would amount to a third world war, you know, except, except in my books, <laughs> then there is a third world war. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I certainly not argued with that. Um, I, I think it's a very difficult time for people who serve there, for people who lost yep. people who serve there. Um, it's certainly terrible for the Afghans, sure. you know. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, Vietnam was my war. I'm a Vietnam yeah. war widow. So, yeah. you know, uh, that was another war that I have to say in retrospect, I look back and think, what were we doing? But right. yeah, you know. tough to rationalize it. Yep. Yep. There we are. Um, Russia, what do you think? Mark Graney, is that, you know, going to be a, a constant antagonist? Yeah, I mean, Hope so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy. It's low hanging fruit. And it's also very, very interesting because of the different types of, of things. I was actually going to ask Rip something along those lines. Um, in, in Killbox, uh, I, I liked the, so, so your, your, your villain is yeah. the head of uh, the yeah. Eastern Liberation right, Army right. or what, what yeah, are they called? Right. Uh, That's exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I just thought that was like, that sounded very Russian. It sounds like what the Russians yeah. would do in Ukraine or in Georgia or whatever they would, uh, or wherever they were. I was wondering right. if, if you sort of researched it, it, like the whole concept of Russia involved in yeah. the counterinsurgency and America involved in an insurgency yeah. um, is very fascinating because it throws, mm -hmm. it flips both things on their heels a little bit. But did, did you research um, Russian counterinsurgency? Absolutely. You know, like what happened in Georgia or what happened yeah. in other places? Yeah. No, you've hit all of them. <laughs> so you, yeah, Georgia, uh, the Ukraine and Afghanistan. So I, I mean, even as a young lieutenant, we read about, we read, two very fine books, one written by a Russian general uh, called The Bear Went Over the Mountain, and then another one written by an Afghan general uh, called The Other Side of the Mountain. So we read, who is the kind of opposite number of the Russian, written in different yeah. years and written very purposefully to be back to back. But no, Russians in a counterinsurgency didn't behave that much differently from the United States. We were more in a nation building. I think we developed businesses and, and you know, people, you know, open schools and things like that. The, the people part became very important to us. But no, you hit on the other aspect of it, which is it's not a hidden secret by any means in the book series. But if you take all of the warriors in the book, I mean, all of us guys who've deployed and fought counterinsurgency and then put us in the role of insurgents, we would do very well because we've been fighting in a counterinsurgency for so long. So yeah, in the book series, the Russians are now placed in the position of being the conventional army. Uh, kind of a la what the United States has done for the past 20 years in Afghanistan. And you have all these foot soldiers, if you will, who have tremendous experience in, on how to plant IEDs and to be a real thorn in the side of, of this kind of larger behemoth. But um, yeah, the, you keyed in on one thing that I didn't know if anybody was going to notice. So you <laughs> appreciate your, your, your read on the book. But yeah, they, there's one scene that Mark was referring to where the kind of senior general named General Timken marches into the office and there's a somewhat more junior Russian general, that is, uh, who is giving a briefing and he stops him and says, wait, the, the new term is Eastern Liberation Army. <laughs> and so <laughs> and before that, they were, you know, organized along the lines of their normal attack lines. But of course, once generals are sitting around, 
you know, with nothing to do and yeah. fighting insurgencies, they rename yeah. all their armies. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like a psyops thing. Yeah, right. this is like the easiest yep. psyop they can do. We're the That's good right. guys. Yeah, we're, we're just yeah, they're the good guys. The good That's guys, right? right. Yeah, just exactly. We're from the government. <laughs> we're, just, and we're here to right. help. We're just the Russian government. We're here to help. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> or the Chinese with their Belt and Road or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's it's interesting for me because I'm older than you guys, and this is a flashback for me when I was a kid in the '50s, and we were in the Cold War, you know, and they had us yeah. like hiding under our desks in case there was, you know, a Russian nuclear attack or whatever. Hmm. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been hosting Daniel Silva for the Gabriel Alon book since he wrote The Kill Artist. And he's always, always had Russia as his primary um, antagonist, mm -hmm. even though he's gone off. They're a good bad other. guy. Hmm? They're a good bad guy. Yeah. 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 To... No, I mean, but it's been pretty consistent, you know, yeah. that that's, and um you know, if you look at um, James R. Ben, who writes, I think, absolutely wonderful books about World War II. He's not a military guy, but his most recent book, he takes um, Billy into the Ukraine and talks about, you know, the Russian, he's talking about the um, the Russian women pilots who were called the night witches, oh, which, yeah. um, yeah. you know, they, they flew so quietly in their little like cloth and paper planes that they could get very close and, and drop things and you know russia russia in the modern era out of necessity has had to put women in the front lines and um mark and i did that a little bit in in red metal but i think that makes it kind of intriguing also for readers is that you know there's a tremendous amount of of thriller readership that are female um mark and i kind of looked at the template for red metal and i i want to say it was about 60 percent were of of our readership was female um or at least maybe maybe i'm thinking of uh, assault by fire but either way the Russians have been always been very good at at making war and conflict and espionage a you know coeducational thing. They have no problem putting women in in whatever lines they need them in order to win wars. Um, so I don't. I guess they've done that since Napoleon, though. So they're it's used a to tough fighting. country. I suspect it's a that tough the women country. are are you know inherently tough, tough because it's not an yeah. easy you know climate to survive in and so forth. Right, that's right. So um, any other things any either any of you all three of you would like to bring up you want to give us a preview of your november release mr cameron oh well it's uh you know <laughs> as mark mark knows it's hard to come up with new plots with without rotating russia china north korea iran north russia china you know those are the baddies and so in this particular plot i I went out with a super empowered individual instead of a superpower um, has to do with a very simple premise of a guy that a billionaire that's got a, a pharmaceutical empire and Jack Ryan's trying to ramrod a bill through that will put it will basically give tax incentives to to businesses in Puerto Rico. This guy doesn't want that. So that that all takes like half a paragraph to talk about in the book and so basically they're trying to stymie Jack Ryan. So I don't think it's given anything away since I wouldn't have put this on the cover copy, but Kathy gets kidnapped and that's the, the crux of the book is trying to get the first lady back and the dynamics of what does the president do when the love of his life is taken? And is he still the president? Can he still function as president? and explore that. So it was a fun, a, a fun book to write because it's very much about Jack Ryan and Kathy Ryan and, and um, that dynamic. Wonderful. I really look forward to reading it. Mark Rainey, why don't you wind us up by telling us about the Gray Man movie? Because I mean, the whole thing is just amazing yeah. and fabulous. Uh, yeah, I, it's coming out. So it was, it was filmed this year between March and uh, into August. And um, it's coming out next year sometime, spring or summer is, is the, all that I've heard. And they're in post-production now. So they finished, they wrapped all the shooting and they're in, it's in post-production. I did read the script um, right as they started the uh, filming and really loved the script. So I'm excited for it, obviously. I have a, a Gray Man book called Sierra Six, which will be coming out in February also. So um, I'm gonna be pretty busy first half of next year for sure. Well, you will be, but tell us about the cast. I mean, I, I really was oh. just, I mean, it's a terrific cast to bring your books to life. Oh, yeah, so Ryan Gosling is playing Court Gentry, who is the gray man or Sierra Six, is, he's also called. 
Um, and then Chris Evans is playing uh, a guy named Lloyd Hansen, who uh, is the villain from the first book. And uh, Anna de Armas has a role in there. And um, there's an Indian actor named Danush who is, is playing uh, kind of a, a, a multi-textured role that I, I thought was very interesting and well done. Uh, there's, a, there's a character that comes in later in the series of books named Denny Carmichael, who is uh, kind of a nemesis to, to Gentry. And he actually makes an appearance in this, uh, in this film as well. So they've taken some stuff out of the whole series and, and woven it in there because they, you know, their intention is to, to make more, more than one of these. Um, and I've, I've got 11 books. So, you know, hopefully they'll, awesome. they'll pull little That's things good. out here and there and, and do another one of these. So just That's to great. be clear, this is a movie and not long form television. Correct. It's it's a film that will be released on Netflix. Ah, got it. Yeah. Will you have a red carpet moment with any luck um, by spring? Maybe you could have one. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I have no idea. I may be, you know, I, I have a Netflix subscription, so I'm pretty sure I'll get to see it today. <laughs> it comes out. Right. I, Barbara, I mean, you it's gotta, just, it's you interesting mention because, them. yeah, it's, well, it's I mean, not... streaming television has really changed you know, so much about the movie industry and where things are released and how people watch them and mm. whatever. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see how they decide to do that. But are you going you to mention into, what's, what's the name of um, Scarlett Johansson suing for, you know, profits or however yeah. that all worked out? Yeah. Barbara, you've got to mention it's, it's, uh, it's not just a Netflix production. It's the largest Netflix production ever created. This is like the Game of Thrones of Netflix. They put uh, two hundred million dollars towards it. So this is, uh, I think, it's going to be a fantastic, oh, wow. you know, adventure. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it will be. It's all very exciting. Well, I hope we'll see you in February, or you may be too busy oh, so, wanting about. No, I'm, I'm not too busy. I love, I love doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, and Thanks for Rip, us. Um, congratulations on publishing you. your second book and i'm really looking forward to red metal too thanks barbara appreciate it. Hey, thank, thank you, you all very much thanks, enjoy thanks. the rest of your day and and your weekend bye hey, thanks a million bye-bye hello we hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors we'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org 100 percent of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.